let's take them three at a time. So. Um, just to cover the downsides of the Trump decision, uh, any views on the effects of this on Australia and Canada? Because those three were always the three anti-musketeers, the three laggards in, in climate change. I'm talking politically here and mainly at the federal level. And actually, while you're at that, also the effect on Saudi Arabia. In other words, can there be some political backtracking? Yes. Hello. Please tell us who you are. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if this is on, but um, Tracy from Oxfam. Um, similar question, actually, and let's be reminded that Trump said he was pulling out of Paris, but also that he would negotiate something fairer, whatever that meant. Um, fortunately, we saw that suggestion cold-shouldered by Italy, Germany and France, who immediately issued a statement that the, the agreement could not be renegotiated. Um, let's hope we see the same by the G20, but there weren't, you know, the, it was notable that the UK didn't stand alongside those countries. It's unclear where, where other countries are going to be. So I'm interested in any uh, reflections or expectations on what we might expect at the G20 and beyond in terms of countries' reaction to this suggestion. Might there be some who are kind of tempted to uh, explore what that means or not? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, Sam Bickersteth from CDKN. Um, putting aside whether the US will now be disruptive within the negotiations or not, um, reminding ourselves that Paris, Paris was a triumph of multilateralism. It would be interesting to hear from you, the panel, about how low a nadir of, against you know, multilateralism the decision of Trump um, was last week. And I guess you've already indicated, Isabel, that China can step in a bit, but it's got massive constraints in filling this space. How much can other communities in the US really fill the space? It's much more than just pulling out of the GCF and the leadership. There's a whole set of technology drivers and even what USAID does or, or LEDs GP, which is partly run out of this building and, and so on. There's so many other parts that have to fill that space. So it'd be good to get a sort of stand back sense of where we are in the multilateral response to what is obviously required to climate change from That's the panel. That's great, Sam. Thank you very much. I might sort of just add a little bit to Sam's question about um, we heard a lot after Paris, and actually also in the run-up to Paris, about other sectors and the importance of other sectors, so business, industry, uh, subnational governments, uh, collaboration between them, how, how powerful a driver can these be, you know, is, is in a sense the top level the top-level process less relevant now. So um, <coughs> Australia, Canada, who wants to take on the political uh, I question? Can go first on Canada, because yeah. okay. I am Canadian. <laughs> that, that, that certainly <laughs> qualifies you, but yeah. <laughs> um, and then maybe a little bit on this kind of multilateralism question as well. I can't speak to some of the others, uh, but I, yeah, maybe a bit on the G20 as well. So um, in terms of Canada, I've actually have been uh, pleasantly surprised, I guess, in terms of the quite strong rhetoric coming from the Canadian government, from Trudeau, um, from Catherine McKenna, the um, environment minister, uh, around kind of Canada's uh, commitment to Paris. So I don't think that you will uh, necessarily see a sort of watering down or Canada and the US and Australia coming together to kind of try to, to renegotiate. I don't think at least the Canadian government would be part of that. I do think, however, that Canada does benefit from the flexibility of the Paris Agreement, and we see that in terms of um, kind of continued support for tar sands, for new pipelines, et cetera. Um, but I'm encouraged, and maybe this sort of touches to the subnational. I think, really, I mean, it's what we see now on climate change is it's all hands on deck, and therefore you can have big impacts from different places. So this is potentially sort of parochial Canadian politics, but we have a British Columbia government that's now just been um, a kind of co new coalition that's been formed um, between two parties that have a very strong green agenda. And that the provinces are quite powerful in Canada, which means you may not have kind of new LNG facilities or pipelines approved on the west coast of Canada as a result of this election. So I think sort of every city government fight, every provincial government fight, th these things are sort of quite important now in terms of, of climate. And I think at least in terms of Canada, the provinces moving in the right direction will create more space for the federal government to stay kind of on the right path on climate. 
in terms of the G20, I mean, we follow the G20 closely, as I said, because of the G20 commitment um, on fossil fuel subsidies. And we are, um, I guess, quite concerned that we won't see progress on that. We saw some progress in the G7, but which was just sort of was progress by the G7 energy ministers who committed to a 2025 deadline for phasing out fossil fuel subsidies. That commitment was not repeated by the G7 leaders at the meeting um, that Trump attended. Uh, in Italy um, two weeks ago. And uh, I think we have some concern about what's going to come out of the G20. But we, again, are seeing, I guess, some signals that I see as almost more positive than I was expecting. You've seen countries like Russia coming out and saying they're committed to Paris, You know, India potentially lining up alongside China to be kind of leaders in the space that um, has been left, the vacuum that's been left by the US. So I think. Uh, no matter what in the G20, there's probably going to be some kinds of tiering in terms of countries that are going to be more proactive, but I don't think we'll see a kind of wholesale backsliding of the G20 as a result of, of um, Trump's decision. Well, well just very quickly, on I, I agree in the G20. As I said earlier, I think it gets more bumpy, but it's not, um, um, you know, it, it's not a sort of deal maker, uh, breaker in terms of Paris and the trajectory we're on. Just a quick thing on Australia, because you're right, it's, it's a government that's, if you like, similarly politically positioned as, as the US. But I was there just a couple of months ago, and the, interestingly, the, the sort of legal profession, senior legal practitioner has come out with the, the legal opinion that, that firms that don't um, don't both recognize the risk that they're running if they're not consistent with a sort of with a Paris outcome and don't disclose what they're doing to be consistent uh, or disclose that risk to their investors. They stand to be legally liable. And the regulators have picked that up, uh, that decision, and they've started to say, well, you know, you've, you've had a legal warning here, and if you don't sort of do something about that, you'll also be getting the regulator down on your back. So out of line with actually the political discourse, you have the economy driven by other senior professions that are independent from the government moving in a direction, which I just think is encouraging. So, so. so Pumi, you've watched these negotiations very closely. So, so I think Sam's question and Tracy's question. Yeah, so I think um, on negotiating something fairer, I don't think there's appetite to start a whole process and there won't be. But don't, be, don't forget, though, that every year before, uh, for those of you who don't know, every year there's a COP, all right? <laughs> At the end of conference the year. Conference of the parties. The conf conference of the parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Okay, that's a full name, right? But before, that normally happens November, December, but there's sometimes up to three what are called intercessionals that actually happen before and usually in Bonn, where the UNFCC sits. So I think there's possibility of those processes being frustrated by um, US administration officials. While that's a possibility, I think the more likely approach and stance they will take is that of disengagement. They, I think they will pull away from it a lot uh, because, I mean, I think, you know, to be a U.S. climate change negotiator in that context, professionally speaking, that's like worse than being a dentist. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, you know, I mean, people are going to hate you when you, when, you, when, you, when you go to the negotiations. I mean, uh, but, but on your question, uh, Ian, on uh, Australia I'm worried about a lot because they, are, they have one of the biggest planned carbon bombs in Queensland at the moment. Uh, which is the biggest mine, coal mine ever. And it, we've managed to keep it on hold for a couple of years now but because we went up the snowy mountain, the, the financiers, you know, all the financiers. <coughs> this is the Adani coal mine with, with India. Uh, but I think they're going to feel bolstered, even though the Trump Australia Prime Minister conversation started off on a bad footing. They seem to have healed their things. But Saudi Arabia is the interesting thing, right? Think about this, right? The newly elected leader of the so-called free world, whatever that is, mm -hmm. right, chooses to make his first international trip to Saudi Arabia, a country that it's not fair to say it's not a democracy because that's putting it mildly, <laughs> right? A country that promotes one of the most 
problematic uh, uh, sex within Islam, Wahhabism, which is the biggest driver in terms of ideological sustenance for Islamic terrorism, uh, and where women's rights are. I mean, I think it tells a very different story in terms of what the social political frame of that presidency is. But f economically speaking, I think this is about trying to bolster them to say stick to Hoyle because they were being they were being ground down in Paris, right? What they went in in the beginning of 2015 and where they ended, even though they didn't move as fast as far as we wanted, but in the end they were actually you know one. And so um, and I think they had made big announcements about solar. Technology. Yes, and 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 basically they can you know they also you They're know solar power or could be th they could be a solar power power, mm -hmm. right? And and they and and they. So on, on, on the question of multilateral impact, Sam, in a funny sort of way, the fact that the world has stood so united against the Trump announcement, in some ways it's actually as sort of kept alive. Uh, Trump has sort of sensitized people in a way to the importance of the world staying together when we're addressing uh, problems that do not respect national boundaries, right? Uh, but let's be blunt about it, right from the get-go, Trump was opposed to multilateralism in terms of his campaigning, what he said about the United Nations, mm -hmm. and, and so on and so forth. But I, I would want to go back to the point about we must go back. You get any young person who's a researcher, go look at the resolutions of each COP and trace who played the biggest role in reducing the level of ambition, and you'll find the end of the United States very, very firmly. Yeah. Certainly the eight years when Bush was there, right? It was a disaster. And by the way, it wasn't significantly better under Obama. Right? However, one might want to sanitize it. Uh, under the eight years of Obama, we made progress, but certainly not as much as when Obama was campaigning and talking about a planet in peril and so. But just on the point of unfairness, um, I, I, I am right in thinking that the United States wrote its own program, I mean, as every other country did, that the nationally determined yeah. contributions yeah. are written by the United States. And it's voluntary. So if anyone's being unfair, they're being unfair to themselves. So, yeah. uh, it's voluntary, and they can rewrite them. So the idea of renegotiating Paris is nonsensical in that context. Every complaint that Trump made about Paris is within the power of the United States to adjust. Well, so sort of. Mm, yeah, it's, there's, yeah, there is meant to be a ratcheting up and an increase of ambition. There's meant to be a ratcheting ambition. up. And I think right. I've, I mean, again, there was, there's been so much But there are no sanctions for failing to. In the last to, five days. Yeah. But there, well, there was a question raised, and again, it could be spurious, that there could be kind of a legal issue if they went down rather than up. Yes. But um, maybe international lawyers in the audience or online can provide some clarity around that. Right. Next round. So. Uh, Neil Bird here at ODI. An observation and then a, a hopefully a related question. The observation is now that the United States has um, stopped any further um, funding to the Green Climate Fund, Japan is by far the biggest contributor to that fund by a very significant amount, and we've not heard that country mentioned so far. And that leads to the question to the panel. All societies, including the international community, look to leaders to offer a positive vision of the future. Where do you see that leadership coming from in the near term? Thank you. Um, uh, I'm Kyle Cheng. I'm a mental health master student at King's. Uh, so I want to talk about the the, the notion of health, it, which has actually came out a few times in, in among the panel. Uh, Ms. Figueres herself talked a lot about uh, the, 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 the connection between climate and health. Once at last year's WHA and another time at also last year, the launch of uh, Lancet's Climate Watch. So. She's been saying how, and I think it, this is also sort of uh, 
I think, a consensus for the panel when you talk about how Mr. Schwarzenegger uh, mentioned that air pollution killed a lot of people in these days, that uh, health is a uh, relatable issue compared to, to degrees or, 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 or maybe planet because people care about their own health. Uh, but also at the same time, this year's WHA, the, uh, the chief negotiator of COP23 from Fiji, uh, Ambassador Shamin Khan, she mentioned that, well, as you know, the, the technical briefing in Bonn was right before WHA, and she came from Bonn to Geneva to WHA, and she was saying how there were literally no discussion on health in Bonn. And while people in Geneva, while we were talking passionately about how uh, you know, climate affect health and health affect climate, and we should be really active, we should be really out spe speaking about that. There's really nothing uh, being said about health in the, uh, in the, in the climate community. So yeah, I was just wondering, w what is your take on this issue? W what, what do you think, uh, maybe is, uh, is the health community not doing enough? What do you expect from the health community to maybe contribute to the climate, you know, actions? And yeah, thank, thank you. you. And this, we'll take a, a third one, which was the lady uh, over there. And uh, we're, we're sort of moving into the closing time. Hi, I'm Laurie Gehring from the Thompson Reuters Foundation. I had a question for Stuart. I think that this issue that you talked about of the pipeline and the lack of that, I, I hear that more and more from all sorts of different kinds of audiences, that there's basically lots of money looking for projects um, and that's not well invested now. And there's lots of projects looking for money, but putting them together just seems this agonizing thing, not least because of just sort of old structures that exist. What do you think really needs to be done to break that and to get that pipeline hooked up so the money flows? Can I just ask the panel to be reasonably succinct in this round, because we're, we're beginning to push up against our time limits. <coughs> Stuart, do you want to answer that? Right, yeah, so, so I'll just take that one di directly. So the, um, uh, a number of issues. Uh, sometimes it's that the uh, investors are not used to operating in the countries and geographies in which some of the need is. Um, and uh, uh, also there's a, an issue with uh, the extent to which the time that they can put their money at, at risk um, versus the, um, you know, ha when they're going to get the, 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 the profits and the return over a longer time, et cetera. Sort of the, the first thing that you can do that's useful is to develop means for the public and the private sector to share risk. Um, and, and that means, for example, that the World Bank, say, or the IFC, the MDBs, they come in uh, rather than taking on a whole project themselves and being the funder of it, they just put a little bit down or they put down a guarantee that then makes the private sector more comfortable to come in. I mean, the, the Chinese chief economist of the PBOC says we will not get the money that we need into sustainable investments unless 80% of it is private sector. So we need to develop different public and private sector ways of working together in order so that the private sector can then come in and take the risk. Um, and that's one of the, the, the key uh, elements that needs to, needs to happen. Thank you. Um, I can quickly kind of speak to the health question. Uh, I, I think it's sort of the same as not seeing anything about fossil fuels. Nobody talks about it in the convention. It's not in the agreements. There are very few side events um, that we know we're starting to see a couple at every COP. Uh, but I don't think that should be discouraging. I think, in particular, health is becoming an indicator in cities and in, in different countries under which it is much easier to sort of make decisions and focus attention. So uh, we are part of a partnership um, of organizations that work on a program called the New Climate Economy. And a lot of that work was around sort of what are the economic benefits of addressing climate. But within that, you know, you have governments that are making economic decisions alongside, well, what are the social benefits? What are the kind of health benefits that they can look at and measure along with jobs and other things to, to make these investment decisions and to make policy decisions? And I think health is a really important one. And particularly, we, we know, you know, in the case of, of very big countries and in this country where it's getting worse and worse, air pollution is one of the more tangible. And although maybe it's not as part, much part of kind of the wider narrative that we would want to see, it is on the policy agenda. 
So I guess I wouldn't get discouraged that there's a lot of things that are not mentioned in the international negotiations. That doesn't mean that they're not really important focus points for work, um, but it may often be at the kind of at a, at a sub-national level or at, at, a, at a country level. It is fairly extraordinary that, that after the Paris, the French heat wave and the 7,000 de deaths in, in France from heat, that, that it, wasn't, it didn't stay at the top of the, of the public attention. It's extraordinary. In fact, I think one of the things, just I'll stay on that question. Yes. Uh, were you done? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, is the, the women's movement decades ago gave us a very powerful uh, concept, but a terribly cumbersome word called intersectionality, right? Which was saying that irrespective of how, uh, you know, if you want to really address gender equality, you needed to understand how gender interacted with race, class, ability, and so on. Similarly, with climate, if we are going to succeed, we need to understand the intersections of climate with the economy, climate with health, climate with social welfare, and so on. And we are, and, and in this, I think, these, the, the traditional environmental movement must carry some of the responsibility, because they also contributed to this idea about there's something called the environment there, there's something right. called development there, and we need to break those silos. Um, <coughs> I want to answer your question. Oh, sorry, just on the health thing in the COP uh, 21, uh, the COP in Durban in 2011, right? That one there was the first one, and Durban's my home city, so I'm proudly saying the first time there was a specific gathering of climate and health happened there. There's a network of health professionals now since 2011 that are mobilizing. If you see me later, I can just hook you up with that. Kumi, you have okay. 90 seconds on Japan and leadership. Ish. <laughs> um, OK. So Japan is a hard one to call right now. Uh, I think right now it would be fair to ex accept that they will do the right thing and they'll stay in, though I do think that they will start straining financially if they're going to have to fill, if they feel they have to fill the gap, you know, of, 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 of the U.S. in its entirety. Uh, I think that it, it remains to be seen in Japan, but I think there's reason to be anxious, right, because there are warm relations there between the U.S. I want to answer the question on leadership, if I might. Please. Right. Albert Einstein once said, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting to get different results. He also said once that if you're trying to solve a big problem, don't use the same thinking frameworks and logics that got you in the problem in the first place. I give you those two quotations basically to say that I'm not looking for leadership from people who hold power in current institutions that are broken. Right? Basically, if you look at it, the, you know, the United States is a liberal oligarchy. It's not a democracy. It has a form of democracy without the substance of democracy. Same set could be said about the United Kingdom, in my judgment. Uh, I mean, what uh, percentage of votes did David Cameron get in the last election? 33%? And he has the kind, and, and, and you know. So basically, within this context, I am not looking for leadership for anybody who is at the World Bank or head of state or anything of that sort. These are all flawed institutions, and we need fresh thinking. We need boldness of believing that something very different can be created for a sustainable world. And I put my uh, faith in leadership in the young people in the global climate movement. I think that's where the most innovative th ideas are coming from. That's where the greatest courage is coming from. And I say to young people around the world, resist when adults say to you, young people are leaders of tomorrow. You have to assert leadership today mm -hmm. because there might not be a tomorrow for you to assert leadership in. On which rather stark oh, sorry. Ah, sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I, I didn't know that was going to be the last word. I would have tried to be a little more optimistic than that. Well, it's not entirely <laughs> pessimistic, but yeah, it, it's a kind of get on with it message, isn't it? And I think actually the get on with it message is also a pretty appropriate 
place for us to pause. Um, I'm sorry we've run out of time. I'm sure we could have continued for quite a long while, but I would like to ask you to thank uh, Stuart, Sheila, and Kumi for their great contribution. <laughs>